What I've started to notice in the world of NFTs, if you're looking specifically, let's call it NFT day trading or flipping, mm -hmm. it's just like anything you've trained, wh traded, whether it's crypto or Forex or any stock. Don't try to catch the top and don't try to, you know, buy at the bottom. Just be happy to double your value. <laughs> Okay, his mic's okay. Sometimes check, if check. it gets too high, that's the only problem. Like it restricts arm movement. That's it. But you can. I'll try not to move. But we find like the, this setting, like just do whatever the fuck you want. Like I end up, like I'll end up pretty much like this half the no, time. No, that's how I sit on couches. I don't yeah. sit like yeah, the yeah. two feet on the ground. I'm, yeah. I'm always like yeah. one leg up or sitting like this. Yeah, yeah. Like I find this to be much more comfortable. Whatever you're with. comfortable with, it's. Yeah. it's we used to be a bit awkward at the, the first like ten podcasts, and then we we're just like, ah, fuck this, do whatever. Uh, okay, are we ready? Yep. So I'll just do the I'll do the intro and explain what we're doing. I'll cut to you, yeah, and then no you worries. you do your intro. So that's kind of like what you'll use. No worries. So it's no an worries. easy clip later. And you can cut my intro out. <laughs> oh well, I'll leave it all. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Fuck it. Uh, are we good? Yeah. Uh, oh, I guess we're all, we can always use this as a recording. Okay, welcome to the Fruiting Body Podcast with your host Brendan. Um, we are a medicinal mushroom company here in Phuket, Thailand. And we've been talking about it for 35 episodes, so who knows if those mushrooms are coming, but uh, stay tuned. We've got way too heavily invested in NFT, so that might be the new project. But let's see. Let's have some fun, and we'll continue to do this on the podcast. Uh, today is a special episode. Um, we have John here. He is going to be asking me some questions about the NFT space, and he's going to be using that content um, for his own channels, such as uh, NFT, uh, NFT TV. NFT today. Today yep. dot TV. Um, so it might be a bit awkward on some cuts, but don't worry, just deal with it. And uh, <laughs> that's it. Um, so first, John will be asking us probably for 20 minutes just about my experience in the NFT space, especially if you've been following on Instagram with the in-betweeners and this Justin Bieber project. We're going to dive deep into that. Then we're going to cut it back and I'll be asking John questions kind of about his career and as we always do, his journey, how he essentially got to Southeast Asia, how he got to Phuket, what he's doing and what's next for him. Um, so let's cut it back to John and let's start his content. Well, thank you so much for uh, having me on today yeah. or <laughs> me, allowing me to interview you on your podcast. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, hey, this is uh, Jay Blue with uh, NFT Today and I'm here with uh, Brendan O'Neill in Phuket, Thailand. And um, Brendan's been doing some really interesting stuff in the NFT space. He's basically started an NFT brokerage uh, firm, if, if, I'm, uh, yeah, that's if I'm if I'm correct in that. So um, if you would, just introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you do. In, uh, tell us what you've been working on. Yeah, um, I'll try to keep it to the point because it's, it's a bit crazy, to be honest. Um, my background is actually in manufacturing electronics out of China, and we both share a similar story along that by living in Shenzhen. Um, we've moved into starting a small project into medicinal mushrooms, hence the name of this podcast, Fruiting Body Mushrooms. Um, that will be coming later. Um, and essentially, we transitioned into an NFT broker and um, I don't, we're not going to say hedge fund, but consulting and advisory. I'll give a quick story of how that all came together. Yeah, and, I'm, and I'm curious. Because, it, yeah, it's really strange. Um, and, you know, it, it's a bit mind blowing, even for us at this stage. We're about two months into it. So essentially, what happened was I've, I've, I've done a podcast on NFTs and we brought a girl in from Bangkok and she was promoting a NFT collection called Pigaboo. And th that's kind of what sparked my interest in November to get into the space. And actually to even take it a st further step back, I've, I have been following Gary V since about March when he was speaking about NFTs. I've never pulled the trigger. I wasn't, there's just too many projects out there. I didn't know, you know, um, who to back and who to get involved with involved with and at that point in time a lot of these nfts were costing 1200 plus dollars on on open season uh i just felt like everything was overvalued it didn't make sense so i, I put everything aside um we got into december 17th to be specific and i was in a golf tournament and i was just following on instagram between holes and i saw a justin bieber post hey just caught my first nft come join the community it absolutely clicked at that point in which I figured out how to purchase that NFT 
on the golf course. Really? Um, I started contacting a buddy. I'm like, hey, can you send me your MetaMask? And we basically worked together where actually it was through his MetaMask connected to OpenSeas to, to, to do the initial purchase. Um, at this point, we just had one NFT and I said, okay, this is great. Now, this was after the first mint and there was two more mints to come. I got back home and I realized if this is going to work, it's got to be this Bieber brand. I mean, I truly believe that moving forward, the not just the celebrity NFTs, but these big celebrities, like your top tens, your Ariana Grandes, your Justin Bieber's, possibly your Drake's. I think their community, there's such a big following that you need that support to have value behind them. So with that in mind, I said, if Bieber's got 220 million followers, I mean, there's no incentive for him to make this a rug pull. It just doesn't make any sense. Sure. I mean, the guy's got half a billion probably. For sure on paper, I mean, you know. Oh, he's I mean, already super wealthy. There's no reason to do like a pyramid scheme or a rug pull. Like it wouldn't saying. make yeah. any sense. And for a guy that kind of, you know, he's already been down and out. I mean, he's and he's had his comeback. For him to come back and cause issues with, you know, with a, a community that he's developed and got his shit together... The rug pull makes no sense. So I did some research into it, and it turns out that the NFT collection is completely backed by uh, Gian Piero, which is his graphic, his, his graphic. I don't want to say his, his artist behind his merchandise, such as Drew House and uh, different album work and clothing and whatnot. So the connection was there, and, and I, I did that research into that and realized that, yeah, he's just... I believe that Bieber is bringing out this NFT collection to give back to his community. And that's why even during the minting, it never sold out. Because the way Bieber posted, it was just an image here and an image there. It was very cryptic. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on his Instagram looking at the camera and saying, hey, guys, I'm launching this NFT program. You guys go buy it. No, it was an image here of the NFT. Go check it out. And this is coming. And was there any utility in his NFTs? I mean, Not, was there no. like, did they get any sort of voting power or anything like that? No, so in it, that, that was the biggest problem why you didn't get the whales behind it. Initially, there, first there was, no, um, uh, there was no advertising, meaning they weren't reaching out to the YouTubers and the, the NFT um, IG influencers that have those communities. And, and, and that's how these projects initially grow from the beginning. He, they did none of that. So it was, unless you followed Bieber or followed Gian Piero, there's no way you would have known about this project. And they wanted, I think they wanted to do that to keep it um, more organic and leaving it to the community of the followers to allow them to have, you know, first stabs. If you blew that up um, through marketing, you're going to get more people that have that financial incentive behind it. And I mean, honestly, that's probably why I did it anyways. I mean, I like Bieber, being Canadian, but come <laughs> on, at the end of the day, we want to make some cash. Um, so we, we did the minting, it took off, and then from there... I decided to reach out to investors in Phuket that I knew had uh, private equity that were comfortable with, you know, and maybe investing 30, 40, 50 grand US and some of them even upwards of a quarter million dollars. We went from my own personal capital of, of raising over about 50,000 US dollars with just a couple guys to about two weeks later by... January 1st, over half a million US dollars in investment. And actually, we keep getting investment every other week, 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand here or there. So we're still growing. Um, what we did behind that is we were now involved, because the minting was done, we are now involved in sniping rare NFTs mm -hmm. from the floor. I won't go too technical in how I do it specifically, but just to give everyone an idea, and to be honest, I shouldn't be sharing this information but eventually it will come out. We're just using multiple rarity tools, mm -hmm. such as rarity tools, VF, uh, V2 rarity sni sniffer, and moment ranks. And I think moment ranks is one of the best ones. These tools allow you, especially moment ranks, to go into the marketplace and do some filtering options. Okay, I want to pay between, uh, let's say the, for the floor price is 0. 0.7. Okay, I want to pay between 0. 0.7 to 1.2. Give myself a range. And then I can refilter it down by um, a, a trait. And let's say I go specifically to the in-betweeners. Okay, I want to check the mouth. And the mouth, they have a bubble pipe. And the bubble pipe is a 1% or actually a 0.98% in terms of rarity. Therefore, 0.98% of the 10,700 collection only have this bubble pipe. Mm -hmm. So let's call it 65 pieces. 
From there, I can refilter it by lowest price to highest price. So immediately, what that tells me, because now everything's been minted and the art's been revealed, I'm going to know specifically what is the market value specifically of that bubble pipe as a trait. Okay, well, if the floor is 0 0.7 and that bubble pipe's pointing for point, selling for 0 0.7 and it is ranked out of the 10,000 ranked, let's say, 1,200, and everything around that on the floor is selling for 0 0.7, but the ranks are 10,000, fuck, man. Boom, you have value. What's more important to look at there is if that's 0.7, that bubble pipe, and the next one to it is, is priced at 1.4, and the next one's at 2, well, you know what the market is selling it for. Actually, the value is getting closer to 1.4. So that's called rarity sniping. Mm -hmm. that, that was my strategy for the investors I brought on. Um, and I was going around to build the rarest collection at the lowest price possible. Now, and as if I'm talking too much, no, just j yeah. jump in. Because I'm, I'm just going to walk us through like my strategy to the point no, no, of where I'm I got. I'm following along. Okay. So that was my strategy initially. Did I overpay? Did, what would I have changed um, from my strategy? I did make one mistake, and it, it's, it's kind of a catch-22. I'm still not sure if I've made the mistake. Okay. Meaning that what I've started to notice in the world of NFTs, if you're looking specifically, let's call it NFT day trading or flipping, mm -hmm. if you want to flip, what you should do is you try to get whitelisted. And if anyone knows, uh, you're going to have to look into that. There's going to be a lot of terminology, whitelisting, gas fees. You're going to have to go watch YouTube videos to understand that. Uh, but if you want to get whitelisted, you get whitelisted, you get involved in the initial mint. And when you buy at the initial mint, these are the winners you will never lose because you've bought at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And if the project ever goes below the mint, well, it's failed anyways. Right. So it doesn't matter. So you get in at the mint and they're going to do a reveal. Most of the time, these reveals, we call them mystery boxes. Just like if you bought a pack of cards at the, of hockey cards at the store when you're a kid, you don't right. know what you're getting. Maybe right. you get the Wayne Gretzky rookie card. Maybe you don't. Right. So you, you buy the reveal or so you buy, you buy the mint and they're going to say after the mint, okay, in five days we're doing the reveal. Well, what's going to happen is all the public is going to get FOMO because they never, they missed the mint. So what happens is the floor price will rise. And then specifically in this case, the floor price ended up hitting 2.3 ETH. It went from 0.27. So almost time 10, times 10 the mint price mm -hmm. within about four days. Now we're getting excited. I'm counting fucking Lambos and yachts and <laughs> I'm like, absolutely. Like, um, you know, I think I'm talking to Hans and we're talking about what yachts we're buying and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> now, in all fairness, it's just, I didn't understand the game and how that actually worked. Now I totally get it and it's, it's clear as day. So up to that reveal, your floor price is rising. And volume is rising. And volume just meaning like sales per day, whether it's number of sales or just total value, we'll call it total value of ETH. As that starts to rise pre-reveal, that's when you need to get the hell out. The second it's revealed, or it could also turn before pre-reveal, but usually it's after, a, a day after. The second that, that the, the floor price changes, well, now it's a seller's market. And everyone, that point, Three ETH, point two three, sorry, uh, 2.38 ETH floor price, it will change in seconds. Mm -hmm. It will go, someone will go, oh shit, now I need to sell. The, it's, it, people are, are changing, they're lowering the price. Mm -hmm. You might never sell. It, you're literally like, okay, one guy is going to go, okay, 2.3. The next guy is going to go 2.2. The next guy is going to go 2.1. There might be zero sales in there and you're just dropping the floor price. But on the flip side, if you're selling before that volume price changes, it's a buyer's market. Right. And the buyers have the FOMO. They're watching it go up. They're going, oh, shit, it's gone 1.5, 1.7. I got to buy before it goes too high. Right, right. Now, it's just like anything you've trained, wh traded, whether it's crypto or Forex or any stock. Don't try to catch the top and don't try to, you know, buy at the bottom. Just be happy to double your value. So if I look back at it, should I have bought, I should have probably purchased three to four days after the reveal. The reason for that is 
all these people after the reveal, they get their rankings. And I'm going to say in a 10,000 piece collection, ranking 6,000 to 10,000, we call them floor NFTs. They're, they're, they're just worth the floor. They're not rare. 3,000 to 5,000, maybe you're worth 10 to 15% above floor. And then you can do the math down 20, uh, rank 2,000, maybe 20, 30%. But when you get under 1,000, you're like 200%, 300%. And then when you get a one of one, you're 1,500% or 15 times the floor. So as that floor starts to drop, all those ranks 6,000 to 7,000 are just selling, selling, selling. And that will just rocket the floor the floor back down within days that 2.38 probably crashed to 1.5 and then one and over the and for the past 45 days we've been going between 0.6 to 9 depending when bieber does a post every time he posts it just rockets Mm -hmm. um so going back to like my my lessons learned um as that floor price was dropping as the as a buyer i was getting FOMO panic on per- on grabbing the rare ones because I was watching the rare ones fly off the market. In reality, I should have waited until I felt there was close to the bottom and then tried to buy the rares because I probably overpaid on some of these rares. However, going back to my example of the bubble pipe, well, yeah, I paid probably, let's say, a 1.5 on one of the bubble pipes. But today, if you went on and you tried to buy a bubble pipe, the minimum is 2.5. 2.2 mm. um maybe even 1.7 whatever it, it, these ones are so rare that actually the floor price dropping doesn't matter anymore and what ends up happening uh specifically now for this project is it's just a cycle of your ranks 6,000 to 10,000 and people buying and flipping and buying and flipping meaning they're buying at the 0. 0.6 it goes up to the nine and they flip and then boom the price comes back down they buy again at the 0. 0.6 and it goes up to the 0. 0.9 um to explain why a market will go uh, sideways uh, specifically for this project and again i don't have experience in any other projects because when you're as heavily invested as i am and you're involved in the discord i truly believe don't spread yourself too thin i've watched friends lose a lot of money Mm -hmm. especially on when you get involved in these uh projects we call them derivative projects Mm -hmm. where they'll uh, companies will, you know, you got popular things like Cool Cats and Doodles, and then they'll come out with something called Koodles. Mm-hmm. It's just fucking Cool Cats and Doodles mixed together, and right. some guy pumps it, and it's absolute horseshit. There's, yeah. there's nothing behind it. Um, so y- that's why I, I focus only on the in betweeners. Now, to the question of why does a project go sideways? Because utility and added value is not established. Mm-hmm. And that's specifically what's happening now in this in betweeners project. I believe that's a great thing. Because all these other projects like Hate Beast, if you're familiar with them, um, Car- uh, Karafuru, these projects in- invest so much in marketing at the initial to build hype. Mm-hmm. Uh, Phantom Fanta Bear, uh, run by Jay Cho. Perfect example. They put all their marketing dollars into the hype, meaning you pay the you pay YouTubers to say top ten NFT collections of January. Fuck, just talk about Fanta Bears and yeah. and Carfuru and Carafuru and uh, um, uh, the other one I just mentioned as well. Let, let's pump those, and that's going to get the buyers coming in, getting the FOMO to purchase it. But you've spent the money on the marketing. In betweeners haven't spent shit on marketing because they know that it's better to grow organically. And anyone from a marketing background, and I also come from an old school SEO black hat background, when you manipulate the algorithms, you will fail in three to five years because people catch up like Mm -hmm. Google search engines and they just go, well, clearly you've put white paste text in the back of your background to rank for this shit and boom, you're you're nobody. So I believe the organic growth is going to turn these companies into blue chips and just because the market's gone sideways now on the in-betweeners, it's, it's not a bad thing. They're actually behind the scenes working with companies like Ray-Ban and Dolce and & Gabbana, and they're creating a brand. And they're creating a product, essentially, that will be possibly one of the largest NFT-branded project uh, products coming out. And I'm going to assume by summertime we hit 2 to 3 ETH. Uh, I used to project we would be hitting 5 to 10, but I think by the end of the year we're pushing 5 plus ETH. That's not to come and say, yeah, we're going to 10, 20 ETH. That could take a couple years. 
But this is why I am backing them and I, and I haven't sold. And to even make it clear to the audience, I am the number two biggest holder in the whole collection. I have 120 of these. Uh, the number one person, Anno, uh, .eth. These are our Ethereum domain names. Mine is, I have two, Fruiting Body and Fruiting Body Podcast. You can go check that out on Moment Ranks for verification by clicking the accounts tab on Inbetweeners. Um, I have 120. I think she has 140. This is, and, and we're holders. We're, we're not even listening. Right. We're not selling. Now, getting back to like the Justin Bieber aspect of it. Well, Justin Bieber is going on world tour tomorrow or sorry, the 17th, whenever that is, a couple days. The guy's on tour from the 17th until March 2023. He's going to be releasing utility of holder sections. This is all being developed. But what ended up happening is Bieber got on board after all his concert tickets were sold. So now his lawyers, the legal team, his marketing team, logistics managers, you know, Bieber is saying, no, I want a holder section for my in-betweeners NFT holders. Well, they got to they got to move mountains now. So it's, it probably won't happen for another month and a half, but that's massive utility. So what they'll end up doing essentially is, okay, you're a holder of, a, uh, of an NFT. It's going to go mm -hmm. into a raffle. Well, I have 120 bears. Therefore, I have 120 tickets into the raffle. They'll have to create a, sec a second collection. It will be called like um, Justin Bieber's Holders NFTs. And maybe you have... Uh, 50 seats per concert. If we know he does 100 concerts, well, that's 500 NFTs, and every NFT has a value as a holder seat specific. Um, it, it doesn't need to be attached to any venue, but what they can do every week is like, okay, guys, we're giving away these. Uh, it's a raffle. We'll put your names in, and they put your, your wallet addresses in, and they just do a raffle. Mm -hmm. Then they give it away. The beauty behind that is you don't need to go to the concert. If I know the value of that ticket is worth 2,000 US dollars, I can then go to the NFT market and sell that. So it's very similar to what Gary V does with V Friends and how he gives away his three, um, I believe if you're a holder, you can go to three of his conference events every year, something like mm -hmm. this. Well, that has a value of two to $500. So when you're buying these initial NFTs, today they're valued at 0.6, uh, Ethereum's at 3,000. So let's call the NFT is whatever, uh, $1,500, whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you know you have the opportunity to win one of the utilities, which could be uh, a Bieber's holder seat, well, the NFT is undervalued. Mm -hmm. And it's just like Warren Buffett says, I want to buy stock that is worth a dollar at 0 0.6, 60 cents. Mm -hmm. And that's where the whales are going to come in. Now, the reason why this project's floor is not rising is because there's too many moving parts behind the scenes with Dolce & Cabana and Merch and Ray-Bans and Bieber Utility that nothing signed off and that that's necessary that that's a really good thing i mean if you told us some bullshit that yeah this we're doing this and we're doing that no the the founders um they're actually saying take a step back let us get this shit done we got to sign off on it and and once it gets there you will have that utility and they're kind of giving us holders the benefit like the benefits now saying guys just put trust in us and sit back and just wait till this releases. Because when that releases, the floor will organically grow slowly. And that's what you want. You do not want floor price like, let's say, Fanta Bears. Pre-reveal, their, their floor went to 8 ETH. Wow. And you know where it is today? 1.5. Hmm. Hate Beast, 8 ETH. Where is it today? 2.3. When you grow fast, you fall fast. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of my... Uh, uh, summary of where we're at there well it sounds like you've done some really interesting stuff and you've kind of figured out your own formula to uh to kind of mitigate the volatility of the market um now uh, on, a, on a on a broader scale more of a macro question um this is a pretty highly unregulated uh market so um what do you uh what do you do to kind of mitigate that as far as like the unregulatedness of the of the entire space oh, i love it embrace it I yeah. love the Wild West Web 3.0. I mean, fuck to each their own. This okay. the Wild Wild West. Like I actually like, I, for the record, I've been kicked out of the In Betweeners Discord. I caused so much damn pan havoc. Um, I'm sure, there's a story behind that as yeah, well. Yeah, of course. I mean, welcome In Betweeners, and you know what I've done to you, and it, it is what it is. So what I what I would do, I know it's it's definitely unethical. It's ruthless. But it is the Wild West, and Hans knows it. I mean, even the mods are attacking me. I would go in and create FUD, you know, fear, uncertainty, and, and uh, I forget what the D stands for. Anyways, it's off, I'm 
brain fart. But I would create FUD in the holders Discord chat saying, because I own 120 of them, I'd say, hey, guys, I'm done with this project. I'm selling them all. Well, why did I do that? Because everyone would go sell and they drop the floor. And when they sold, I mm -hmm. bought them. That's right. Sorry. Paper hands, they fold. And if you want to be a paper hand, I'm going to buy off you. And I know it's harsh, but this is the world of Web 3.0. And you need to be a diamond hand. You need to trust it. You, too many people are coming in here for a quick flip. Mm -hmm. And I will buy all your NFTs. <laughs> That's awesome. It uh, is what it is. Well, so um, it sounded to me like when you first got into this, you already had a background in, you, you were already well-versed in cryptocurrencies and blockchain. But for someone new who wants to get into the NFT space, do you think it's a, it's a pretty high barrier to entry? I mean, is it pretty easy to, to get in and, and, and purchase your first NFT? Or is it, is it a rather difficult process? It's difficult. It's very difficult and it's very scary. Okay. No question about that. I, I probably didn't, I probably slept three hours a night for the first month because I did not have a cold storage. I was purely off the MetaMask and that mm -hmm. scared the living shit out of me. Um, you, if you're getting into the NFT space, just like Gary V says, type in what is an NFT and just start from there. I would say, like he said, and again, it's, it's regurgitating that information, but I a hundred percent agree with him. You need to put 50 hours of research in watching YouTube um, the very first step, what I would have done from the beginning, but we didn't have time because things were moving too fast. I would invest in cold storage. Um, unless you have your own exchange, um, that you can be purchasing NFTs directly on. And a lot of the exchanges are moving over to that, like Coinbase and Binance. Mm -hmm. There's safety in that. However, why do you want your country to know what you hold? Right. I would much rather be DeFi. I'm a hundred percent DeFi. Right. I can't go into all the ins and outs of how we did that. You but. don't have to. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, step one, cold storage. Um, I personally have full four pieces of cold storage, but I highly recommend the Nano X Ledger. That's not yep. a sponsorship. There is the Nano S. The Nano X is about 5,000 baht. The Nano S is half of that. Um, they're two different models. They're the exact same thing, but the feel and the the buttons on the Nano S on the Nano X, it's just it's so much better. Five thousand bots about what one hundred and eighty bucks. One hundred and eighty bucks, but I, we won't go into the technical of of uh, uh, maybe I will because actually th these are important lessons. Um, like when you're setting up your Nano X, you need to first. Understand your 24 board password. Hold that. Maybe use a, an app on your web on your phone called Dashline. Um, I know some people encrypt their 24 word password, meaning like uh, Vitalik, the owner of Ethereum. What he used to do is he would take the 24 word password and he would put it into six words each, and each of those six words would be encrypted of a key that he only knew the encryption. He would then give out six words to four different people that did not know each other uh -huh. at all. That's But you're talking he probably had billions of Ethereum. Absolutely. So that's one way to... I, I wouldn't go that depth. The easiest way to do it is you take an Excel, you encrypt the 24-word password, you encrypt the Excel, and you email yourself the Excel. Um, you should... If you're really investing a lot, like over 100000 you should literally buy a... Uh, a laptop that's only plugged in by ethernet use a vpn when you do all your purchasing use brave browser and only use that for crypto that's right don't use anything else that's the the that i call that like the standard protocol do i do that no should i yes um but yes phase, phase one definitely you need the the ledger now also the reason why it's going to save you on gas fees if you go on with your MetaMask and you purchase X amount of, I mean, I bought about 120 of these on a MetaMask. Well, you need to th then transfer them to your ledger. Mm -hmm. Well, when Ethereum's high and gas is high, you could be paying $80 a transfer. Right. We got lucky that Ethereum crashed and I knew when to do the transfers on gas. So I was getting it down to an average between 12 to 20 five us dollars so right. a point you, you i didn't want to be paying more than 0.005 or 0 0.006 ethereum on the transfer um but yeah you you can you can purchase on your ledger by connecting your hard wallet to your metamask and your metamask will connect to the open seas or wherever you're purchasing mm -hmm. but your 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 ledger is connected to that now the beauty behind the ledger 
uh, or what's called the cold, cold storage, is when I go do that purchase, I need to be plugged into my PC and I need to do the authorization. A couple small things, and I'll run through that part quick. You need to have blind sign signing enabled, number one. Um, you need to make sure that you have, you've authorized, you've created your Ethereum address on your live ledger, which is an application for ledger. And then you need to install the ECR721 token, mm -hmm. which allows you to accept NFTs. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure what could happen, but I've heard that if all of that is not set up properly and you were to transfer from your MetaMask to your ledger without the, the ECR721 uh, 720 or 721 token set up it might just get lost in the, the right or just it doesn't understand what it doesn't doing. understand what's right. what you're doing so that needs to be set up um when you set up your 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 metamask your live ledger needs to be sorry when you you set up your cold storage on the metamask your live ledger needs to be closed um and any other tips or tricks that i've seen that are a fucking headache <laughs> um no th th those are the major ones that like you could be sitting there like purchasing. Pur what the fuck's going on? And it's like, oh, your blind signing wasn't enabled. Okay, purchasing. Why isn't this going through? Oh, you didn't set up ECR 21. Right. Stop. Little things like this. Sure, sure. Well, that's very informative. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've already talked, and you said you love the Wild West aspect of this. But I saw today that the New York Stock Exchange actually filed a patent um, to create their own um, <laughs> NFT platform. So what do you think when the big players like this are getting involved? How is this going to change uh, change the space? It depends on like, um, I, I, it's good that, I think it's more in the crypto space, like when the S SEC is coming in and the New York Stock Exchange is coming in and these big, uh, big banks are coming in like Goldman Sachs. Um, it's going to force there to be regulation. Now that's, that's, the first step will always be regulation in the crypto space. Then it will trickle down into the NFT space. I mean, it's basically the same thing. Um, with regulation, then you have big money. With big money, crypto is going to go up. Now, initially, I think what will happen is crypto will go down just like it has. And, and crypto is always volatile. It's, you know, just like uh, it's like the tides coming in and going out. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good thing for the crypto space regulation. Um, we're going to need we're going to need that. And, and we saw this in Web 2.0, you know, and, and even social media of, you know, uh, people uh, let's say purchasing domains back in the day that that was the job to go through and just buy China. I have a friend here that bought China.com back in 1995 and made a killing. So that regulation coming in, um, it will be a good thing. And I think it will inevitably increase the, the, the value of things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and just crypto in general. Mm -hmm. Well, you've um, you're talking about a lot about Justin Bieber and is he does he have any plans about doing something with like live concerts in the metaverse and then maybe the holders of his nfts can get free access to this stuff i mean we the NF, nfts in the metaverse are kind of very uh interconnected. together interconnected and so i'm just curious on your thoughts on this is does justin bieber have any plans that you know of to do something big in the metaverse or is he already doing something like that he actually already did it before the, this project even existed okay um there, he did a metaverse, one of the first metaverse concerts. Bieber is so dialed into this, and that's a whole other conversation. Uh, I believe the metaverse, and let's specifically talk about Decentraland and Sandbox, mm -hmm. I think it's too new. Mm -hmm. And again, this is uh, more information regurgitated from Gary Vee, but now that I'm involved, I, I truly believe it's too new. The Sandbox is still doing alpha testing. We're not even at beta testing yet. Right. And tell me one person that is participating in the metaverse you know. I can name a mil a lot of people but purchasing NFTs, but I don't know anyone. I think Snoop Dogg is, Snoop is is pretty heavily into it. They have their land, but I mean, physically, me or yourself sitting at the computer and putting on the Oculus and playing in the metaverse. Well, we live in Phuket, Thailand. Yeah. The outside's too beautiful. It's to, too I, why don't want to? Why do I want to plug in my computer when I can just go outside to go to the beach? I, I and I also <laughs> I also think it's just not the the infrastructure is not set up. So let's say you have in betweeners land. And you've set that up. Well, now you need to develop in it. And now you need to create um, uh, like, like law within that land itself. Otherwise, you're going to have 10,000 NFT bears just running around and, and doing what? Are, are we playing games? Like there, there's so much infrastructure that needs to be developed before you just turn the key to the metaverse. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I th- I'm guessing I'm gonna say the metaverse won't really be operating until maybe summer 2023 or even later than that. Well, there's also so many people creating different metaverses. Will they be interoperable? I mean, absolutely. So I'm I'm in this world, but you're in this world, but we can we can all hang out together. You can jump between worlds. I can be once you, your NFT is just representing like I own this piece of art. And then guys like Hans, we were looking into, you can reach out to, let's say, the reality is like Indians on Fiverr and, and, and they can use programs called, I think, what was it called, Hans? VOX? Yeah, Vox Editor. Vox Editor. And you can basically pixelate your NFT. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I could lie and say I own a board ape and pixelate it and go live in the metaverse, but then, you know... Maybe you get beat up in the metaverse. I don't know how that works, <laughs> but you, you know you don't want to. You don't want to. You want to keep your credibility as well. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, your NFT is like your avatar, and I think there will be different worlds in the metaverse from your G rated to your rated R's, mm-hmm. uh, and and you'll probably need some sort of authentication to get into those worlds. You don't want kids jumping into a, a metaverse where it's like GTA. Or something like that. So I foresee that happening. But yeah, absolutely, you'll be jumping in between Axie Infinity to Decentraland to to the Sandbox. And there was another one I saw the end other day. I think it's called NFT World. It looks really interesting as well. But yeah, I think you'll be jumping around world to world because they'll all offer different things. No different than playing Xbox, PlayStation, or Nintendo. So we need the adult film industry to get involved with it and then everyone else will follow along exactly. like they did with Blu-ray and uh, VR and everyone else. So. Just follow behind them. <laughs> exactly. It's. I mean, this is inevitable for sure. But I think they'll, even those guys, they'll they'll create their own. Uh, they'll have their own land. Who knows in the, in 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 uh, uh, decentral land sure. or the sandbox. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, that about sums up most of the questions. I, I and I really appreciate you this yep. deep dive today. Um, I guess is there any other projects that you see out there that you're really excited about? Anything else that that's happening in the space that you're like, wow, this is really awesome. I want to get involved with this. Um, I would say like a big shout out to full send. Uh, full send is run by the, the Nelk boys. And they're also in collaboration. And they initially went into collaboration with, uh, the in-betweeners. Uh, they brought on the president of Nelk, also president of, uh, ha- uh, happy dad. Um, and these guys are really involved with the UFC, uh, J- John Shahidi. And the interesting thing, Thing behind these guys is they're selling nfts not as digital art but as a pass to the let's call it the full send club and what i truly believe nfts are because they're showing that that side of it i honestly believe the art is completely worthless and completely horseshit um it can look amazing but i truly believe nfts represent stock without going IPO, behind who's representing it. Mm-hmm. Um, to explain the, the Nelk Boy side, you're buying a pass called a Full Send card that gives you access to meet and greets. Um, they're doing raffles. Hey, guys, we're in Texas and we're going golfing. Uh, we're going to raffle off uh, anyone in this Texas area that can come on the golf trip with us. Hey, guys, we're going to the UFC. I got five extra tickets. Who's in Denver? Who's in California? Uh, let's, let's, let's raffle that out to our full send members. Let's create, uh, they're creating gyms and clubs. All, they'll, they'll develop this ar- around the whole U S I think they're one of the first that's going to have this like, um, exclusive, uh, you know, access to their, their clubs. And, and essentially what you're buying is stock into their company because by, by their floor price going up and then those, those, um, uh, NFTs, uh, changing hands, they're getting the 10% commission on the transaction, which money at percentage goes back to the community wallet, which allows them to invest, which grows them as a company and as a brand. And as they grow as a brand, just like any stock in the world, your stock price, the floor price will go up. I think this is a very good representation of where I see NFTs going in that world. And that's kind of what actually I can bring it back to in-betweeners and what I think they truly are. My rule of thumb and why I'm so behind the in-betweeners is because there's actual value behind it. If I know the value of Justin Bieber is half a billion dollars, not his net worth, let's call it Justin Bieber Company Limited. Mm -hmm. If I know he's worth half a billion dollars and the floor price right now is 0.6 and I know the market cap of them currently is 23 million. 
Well, I can pin that against the Board 8 Yacht Club. And the Board 8 Yacht Club, let's call it, it's actually worth more than a billion. But the floor price, let's say, it, is at 100. Well, therefore, the math is, if, I, if Bieber is value as a company today, and he's going to grow over the year of this tour, mm -hmm. let's, let's call it half a billion. <clears throat> and I pin that against the Board 8 Yacht Club at a billion. And if their floor price is represented at 100 ETH, in theory, in theory, Bieber should be, their floor should be 50 ETH, in theory. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. So if I took it a further step back and just went super conservatively, even at a floor price of 5 to 10 ETH, he's still undervalued. You're undervaluing him as a company. So that's kind of how I'm starting to vision that. Like it, getting involved with celebrities or companies you're you're investing in them in stock without them having to go deal with lawyers and the New York Stock Exchange and spending millions of dollars on going IPO. That's another way to look at it. And then again, if we look at NFTs as a technology, that's a, another 30 minute conversation if, you know, <laughs> what it could be used for. Sure, sure. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of uh, exciting stuff happening. So I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, out of your busy schedule and to... Uh, Come on this, uh, come on this show with us. Yeah, and we'll, we'll jump. Uh, so we'll jump back to we'll we'll talk to John about uh, his journey, his experience. I was going to tell one more interesting story as well that I think could be good sure. for your viewers. How are we on time? We probably hit twenty minutes. Uh, no, we're on fifty. Fifty minutes. Fuck, that's going to be way too. We'll, we'll fifty. Fifty. We'll go fast. We'll eh? take away like. Minutes. Anyways, we'll cut it back. You no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't it matter how long it is. People yeah. can watch it. Yeah. You know. So I'll, I'll come back to a, a very interesting story of what happened in the in-betweeners about, uh, uh, I'm going to say a week ago, and Hans was involved and, and whatnot. So the in-betweeners, these, these discords and these projects, um, one of the utilities they'll offer is a whitelist on other projects that are about to mint. So there was a company that came out called Squiggles. Squiggles was essentially a derivative of a 3D uh, art of a ripoff of do Doodles. Now, a month ago, Doodles came out and tried to file, file a lawsuit against Squiggles. And they said, hey, uh, you just fucking literally took our art and turned it into 3D. Like, this is horseshit. You can't do that. But in the Wild West, who are you suing? I mean, we're on the blockchain. There's no one to sue. So that, that's a big, big issue there. So then th those companies like Doodles and uh, don't sue me, but... Uh, Okay, maybe they did it, maybe they didn't, but then they can take it into their own hands. So Squiggles came out, and right before, now, sorry, so to step it back, so the in-betweeners, they gave, I got a whitelist because I have 120 in-betweeners, therefore I won the raffle, so I'm whitelisted. Right before the, they wanted to do a public mint first, Squiggles. So they're doing a public mint of 3,000 people. The whitelist was 3,000 people and the, the whitelist was 7,000. So they right before the, the public mint, uh, a white paper came out on Discord that doxed the entire Squiggles founders and threw them under the bus, saying these guys are rug pullers. They did it on this project. This was like a 20-page document that was super in-depth. It was insane. You can go look at this on Twitter. It's very, I won't go into it, but it was insane. So everyone still went forward and they did the minting do well hypothetically maybe uh doodles did this but it, it, it was a genius wild west attack and it's the first one ever at this level first you should also understand squiggles was the one of the biggest hype projects coming out just under uh uh hate beast and very close to invisible friends and i don't think invisible friends is out yet they had like 300,000 people in the Discord. Like you went into those Discord chats, you couldn't even type a word. It was insane. Mm. Right before, so right before the public launch, they released this white paper. Then they went to the public launch. They released bots at the public launch that purchased like tons of these, of, of minted all these NFTs quick. And the mint was one Ethereum on the public launch. And they immediately sold them in seconds for 0.3 ETH. Why did they do that? To just crash the floor price. Now, if I'm your competitor and I'm Doodles, and Doodles is like top five or 10 uh, in terms of market cap uh, as an NFT, it's a genius idea. So we've made, I don't know, let's call it, they've probably made hundreds of millions of dollars, Doodles. Let's just take a million dollars, buy all their fucking NFTs, and crash their floor. 
Mm-hmm. It's part that's part of the, the strategy. Um, and that really brings it back to Web 2.0 when people used to do this was Black Hat SEO. I'm your competitor. Great. I'm going to take your website link and I'm going to feed it into porn websites. Uh, right. I can black hat your website and crash you through Google SERPs through these black hat techniques. Now, you can't do that anymore. This is what's going on in Web 3.0. So Squiggles crashes. Now I got the whitelist. So me and my buddy come on and Squiggles like they're panicking. They're going off. They're like, okay, what are we going to do to get it back? So what they said was now the floor is at like 0.3. Well, the minting is 0.4 on the whitelist. Who the hell is going to whitelist when now I can buy it at 0.3? So Squiggles is like, okay, we need to increase our floor. So they go, anyone who buys right now will do an airdrop free before the whitelist. So boom, the floor rockets up. Well, it's simple math. At whitelist, I can mint one. But if you buy one now at 0.3, you get two. So actually, you're paying 1. 5, uh, 0. 0.15. So the floor ended up rocketing up to like 0.8. I got in and on the Ethereum blockchain, me and my buddy got it. We were the last ones until OpenSea delisted them. Mm. So we're, lo- we're watching it. We buy at 0. 0.68, which we're getting two. So it's like we're paying 0. 0.3, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, and we're also going to whitelist at 0.4. So me and my buddy are watching this and like we buy a 0.68 and the floor rockets up. We're watching it like, holy shit, like the floor went from like 0.8 to 1 to point, uh, 1.2 to 1.5 to 2 to 3 to 4 in seconds. So we're freaking out. Like we went through an emotional roller coaster. We're like, what's going on here? Like how is the floor at 4? It wasn't. They were delisting everybody selling so no one could buy. Open Seas delisted the entire um uh collection by taking off anyone trying to list to sell to not allow anyone to list to sell and you can actually check this out go on the ethereum blockchain check out squiggles the last purchase of activity on open seas is by freedom 44 which is my buddy here and we were the last one and i told him just you should turn that into an nft that'd be pretty dope (laughs) (laughs) anyways that's that story and they're gonna try to come back out and do the minting again but there's so much fud that who the hell's going to buy it. So sure. anyways, that's that story. Okay. Sure. Well, let's turn it back over to you because yeah. I already did my outro and we can, yeah. I can edit around. Yeah, yeah we'll, deal, we'll deal with that. So um, grab a sip of water. Uh, we're at we're probably about an hour. No, 53. Mm. Okay, so we'll take 30, 40 minutes and dive into this. Okay, so now we're going to take about 30, 40 minutes. We'll see how that goes. We'll try to keep it under this 90 minute mark. Just keeps it more digestible. We used to, our first like, 20 pod or 15 podcasts were about like two and a half hours. I don't know. I thought I was fucking Joe Rogan or something. It was ridiculous. <laughs> They're just way too long. Um, so we're going to jump back to John. And as we do on Fruiting Body Podcast, it's more about his journey and um, how right. he uh, came to Southeast Asia, what you were doing before, what brought you here, what you're doing here, and what are the next steps for you? So let's just start back. Uh, I believe you're from, is it South Carolina? Uh, actually, well, not and, and from you, either, but I, I used to live in Eastern North Carolina. Eastern North Carolina. Um, I had finished up my uh, MBA at East Carolina University, and I had started a business there, um, which was mostly like a marketing and production-based company. Um, a lot of our a lot of our money came through... Um, doing marketing videos for different departments at the university. And then uh, during the spring, summer, and fall, um, we would do uh, photos and videos for lots of weddings along the coast, and uh, which is a beautiful area. Uh, brings a lot of people out there to do, uh, to do weddings. And so I had a pretty successful business there um, with mostly just contract employees. So, and, and let's just do a, a little bit of an introduction about yourself before we like sure. we'll go down that, that rabbit hole. Explain like how... How would we define who is John? Like, is it like you want to, is it a marketing guru? Is, or is it very holistic or how, how would you sell yourself to a client? Uh, I would sell myself as probably a nomadic filmmaker, um, uh, a freelance pirate, <laughs> there we go. Free, freelance swashbuckler, <laughs> underwater astronaut. I don't know. I love sailing. I love scuba diving. Um, I love making films. And in fact, uh, most of my life is spent shooting a lot of short films with friends, um, either write, produce, direct, edit. Um, none of them, you know, Oscar winning yeah. <laughs> films here, but, uh, you know, I just love, I love being on set. I love uh, shooting films. I love traveling, um, love motorcycling, love sailing. So I would just say I'm more of like a, a, a travel bum who has a camera, uh, and likes to film stuff. <laughs> that would be, 
That's how I wouldn't know if that's a good sales pitch, but that's that's what I would. That's how. But I would it's more sum up my life. Like it's this freelance passion project behind it, and um, and before maybe bring the mic down a bit. It's a bit loud for me. Some maybe you could probably pull it about there. Everyone's different. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I am a loud um, talker. Yeah, no, that's that's why these mics. Like some people, I'm like, all right, you're gonna have to get closer. No. Um. So. We'll we'll take that step back and connect it all. So initially, you you were you've started your own company in the U.S. and and uh, let's recap specifically what were you guys doing, the types of projects, and what led you over to Southeast Asia. Um, I'm not quite sure what led me. Well, I I, I so yes, we were doing a lot of uh, production based marketing, so like more content uh, media versus um, you know SEO type stuff. Um, I was just sick and tired of living in the States. I think there's something, something to be said about Eastern North Carolina where I was living. Um, it's a lot of, uh, I'll just call them what they're, there's a lot of rednecks and, <laughs> and they, uh, they haven't traveled very much, but they're like, oh, America's the greatest country in the world. And you're like, okay, well, have you ever left? And they're like, no. And I, I, and I look at that analogy, like yeah. pizza is the best food in the world, but I've never tried sushi or I've never eaten a cheeseburger. So like you know you don't have a reference point to say this is the this is the best and the greatest unless you you know actually have something to compare it to, um, and I really wanted to get out. I'd done some traveling through Central and uh, America before, um, and and loved just kind of like you know traveling around the world, and um, I thought you know what let's the easiest way to move or to get out of the country is to have a job when you land. So I just started looking at like, what's the easiest way I could get a job and get paid and like guarantee that I'm going to have this job for at least, you know, like your stepping stone, Yeah, a stepping stone to, to, to facilitate the the transition to another country. Um, And so uh, then I found, you know, that teaching English was a, can be a profitable job um, if you uh, are willing to move to countries that maybe aren't, (laughs) <laughs> your first choice. Yeah. Uh, and so then doing a bunch of research, I found that China pays, you know, very well, uh, you know, four or $5,000 a month to, uh, to go there and teach adult uh, adults. Now I don't have any background in teaching, but I grew up speaking English. So I said, Oh, you know, this, I can do this. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's kind of where it started. I, uh, I took a job with an adult language firm in Shenzhen, um, which got me out of the U S uh, you know, they pay for the flight, they pay for your uh, apartment, uh, you know, so it, it was, it was a very easy transition. And it's, at least it's kind of set up before you hop on the plane. Right. Actually, I won't, I've, I've told this story before, but my story is pretty much the exact same. Yeah. It's like, I wanted to get the hell out and I went to Taiwan, secured the English And I probably job. should have gone to Taiwan because yeah. <laughs> Taiwan is the real China. Yes, I said it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, oh, great. This whole channel has just been canceled <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, if you want if you want the real Chinese experience, go to Taiwan. Yeah, um, they didn't uh, destroy all of their artifacts when they're in their cultural de-evolution. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, so I went to China. Um, at first, I loved it. Uh, it's you know, very different. Very. I mean, it, when I say different, it's 180 degrees difference. And w- which year did you arrive? I arrived in t- uh, March of 2017 okay. to Shenzhen, which is a big new clean city. Um, and, uh, it's, you know, it's very, it's just very different. Um, you know, uh, I I found some of the cultural differences to be funny at first, but I think over time they start to just wear you down, wear you down, uh, and, and start to make you angry. Um, you know, children in the shopping mall shitting over the the pushing and shoving to get onto the first floor elevator that doesn't go anywhere else. Um, you know, or they're shoving your way onto a subway train at a stop when people are trying to get off. So I was trying to teach Chinese at one person at a time by, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it was going to take me a long time. It, so. it, it can be a bit draining, and especially in cities like Shenzhen when the heat comes out, mm-hmm. then it just definitely wears you wears you down. I mean, I where, which area? I was in Shuko. Where were you, which area were you? Uh, at first, I was in Longhua, which is up, yeah. uh, up north above Futian, and then yeah. I moved to Shuko. Yeah. Um, and Shuko was a big change because it's a lot more of a foreign influence there. There's, you know, bars and nightclubs and, you know, live music and things. It's a bubble. That, yeah, it's, it's certainly a bubble of, of foreigners in, in uh, China. And I liked that it. it was close to Hong Kong, so I could just jump across the border and uh, on the ferry or the, the take a 
Now they have a high speed train. You know that they have a high speed train and I heard to Hong Kong that goes straight to uh, Kowloon. But don't you have to hop on like up north or something on it? Like I, you think, th- I think there's a I think the stop is through Shuko or Futian. Oh, okay, so it's just hop on in 20 minutes. You're there. Um, but uh, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Oh. Uh, Hong Kong. I love going to Hong Kong. It's a beautiful place. As soon as you cross the border, it's like ah, freedom again, you know, like the, like normal people. And this is not, uh, I'm not trying to be. Anyone so, that lived in Shenzhen understands. If, if you've lived in China, it's, it's, you'll, you'll understand. This is not me trying to yeah. uh, be pejorative towards that. But then don't you find like, so I lived there five, six years, whatever. That whole Hong Kong experience, like when you're living in Shuko and you run over there, then there's a point where you're like, I don't want to go. Because it, it it's it can be draining as well. You got to get on the bus. You got it's, it's a process. It's a process. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't recommend going over there, like staying for sunset drinks and then being like, all right, let's take the train back. Yeah, and it's like, oh, oh. By the time you get home, it's better just to spend a night and yeah, make a couple days out of it. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, working for a, a language, uh, adult language school, I was doing a lot of uh, networking with uh, adults. You know, you can hang out with them. You can go out for dinner and drinks. You can even date them. You know, it's a, it's very different, I think, than teaching children, which I wouldn't know because I've never taught children. Um, but I use that to uh, to basically leverage some uh, jobs, uh, freelance marketing, stuff like that. And then eventually I got a job working with a blockchain company um, where I was doing a lot of their, again, content media. So whether it was uh, videos or some online marketing um, we had some Chinese that would do the Chinese stuff, and my stuff was more towards focused towards Westerners. And this is you're working with Wes at this point. Yeah, I actually was. I was working with okay, Wes. Okay, because I'll post this to Wes. Uh, uh, hey, Wes. I know Wes quite Wes? well. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll send him the video, and he can give it a watch. I hope you're enjoying the freezing cold weather in yeah. Detroit right now. Yeah, he's definitely not. <laughs> he's definitely not. It's uh, funny because I saw on Facebook, I'm like, oh, how the hell does he know Wes? And then when I checked your YouTube, I'm like, and he did a video with Wes. In, in yeah, Detroit. we did. Uh, we did a several of them. We yeah. did. Um, Shout out to Eastbound and Up. Uh, yeah. That's actually Wes and I that created this uh, YouTube channel that was meant to be kind of uh, uh, inspirational, motivational, Lifestyle. travel-related films type stuff. Um, and yeah, so uh, the side note, side yeah. note altogether. Um, so we'll go back to, so now you got this job doing like marketing, but specifically on like video production for a mm-hmm. crypto company. When you first started, what was your level of experience in crypto? Almost none. Almost none. Yeah, almost none. Um, and I wouldn't say, I still say I'm, I'm still pretty novice, even though I've been working for blockchain-based companies for like four or five years. Um, uh, I don't know what it is. I like the idea that we're on working with cutting-edge technology, but a lot of it I'm just kind of like, eh. I'll, so I, I'll buy Ethereum and buy Bitcoin and just hold on to it. Yep. And that's about as far as my involvement is. Uh, <laughs> um but, uh, yeah, so then I, it, uh, I got a, a different job with a company in Hong Kong, and then I was living in Shenzhen. And I said, what am I doing living in China um, if I'm working remotely? Yep. Uh, so I just decided uh, about three years ago to move to Bangkok, um, which I thought I'm originally from New York or just outside the city in Long Island. I've always liked big cities. Um, but then Bangkok in March is uh, very hot. Yeah. Very, very, very <laughs> hot, like 45 degrees Celsius and no wind or rain. Um, and I already had friends down here and I've been wanting to learn to sail. So it wasn't, I think I was there for like three months, maybe four months in Bangkok. And I said, Phuket, let's go down there. And uh, so that's where I've been. I've been down here now for the last three years. Yeah, it's definitely the the right decision, especially like I was also living in Shenzhen, exact same thing, factory in Foshan. And we talked about this before, but it's like, you know, why am I working remotely in Shenzhen when my factory is two hours away? I might as well. That's what pushed me to Phuket. And also, like go, going back to your point, living in Bangkok in these hot cities, after you've lived in these Asian cities for a couple of years, it's enough. And that, that, that sense of relief when you get down to Phuket, it's like I, it makes you realize I don't think we were meant to live in cities. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> nice to visit. It's great. Like I have no, pro- I love Bangkok, but I mean, maybe for a weekend and then get back here. Cause mm-hmm. I just feel th- there's just, you're more calibrated living in this type of environment, even though Phuket's a big Island, it still feels like a small town. Sure. Um, so when you moved here, now you moved down to the South, how did you decide? Um, and I think this information could be 
relevant, especially for anyone looking to come to Phuket. How did you make that decision to move down to your Rawai? I'm, I'm down in Rawai. Yeah. Um, I'd been down there to visit before. And uh, so I already had some friends who were sailors. Rawai is also on a peninsula. So you're surrounded by, it's probably about seven beaches. Um, there's like three major big beaches and then, you know, a bunch of smaller ones. And um, so if you like going to the beach or snorkeling, you've got a lot of different options uh, for viewing the sunset or going swimming. Um, also, I've lived in many places that are very seasonal. And when I, when I mean seasonal, I mean like tourist seasonal. Um, I, when I lived in, uh, or in, in grad school, that, that town empties out in the, in the summertime, but I still live there. I lived in South Florida and Naples, which is busy six months out of the year. And the other time of the year, it's, it's quiet. And I've learned that I don't really enjoy the busy season with lots of tourists around because it just becomes crazy. And Rabai being as far away from the airport as you can go and about 20, 30 minutes south of Patong, even in the high tourist seasons, you still wouldn't see that influx of thousands of people that you do in Patong, let's say. Yep. And maybe, I don't know, you, you live here in Surin Beach, so I don't know how crazy it, it gets, gets here. Crazy. But your Bang Tao is right up the way. And I mean, all this area is, is pretty crowded. Um, and so I moved down there for that reason as well. Um, although I think during COVID, uh, word got out that Rawai was the only place that was still hopping on the Island. Um, all the restaurants and bars were still open and like, you know, whereas you drive through Kata, Karone and Patong and everything was sh literally shuttered. Um, so I think word kind of got out online that Rawai was the cool place to be. And so now it's. Now that the borders have opened back up, we're, st we're starting to see, I think, more tourists down there than we would would have normally in the last, uh, well, two years. doesn't really count because of COVID. So yep. the year before. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's <clears throat> yeah, why it's, it'd be my, my second choice. The, the, the nice thing living about he, living up here is if you are, you know, looking to get on a flight frequently, then it makes sense. But with COVID or the C word, and, um, well, you're not flying anywhere anyway, so who cares? No. Nope. Um, now currently in, in terms of what you're doing, are you just doing strictly freelance production? Um, do you have some sort like a community down in Rawai that you're able to connect with for your type of uh, business as well? Well, you know, I'm, I don't really like to work. Um, I like money and I like to have fun, but, uh, as far as no, I'm, I'm working for a company that's now based out of Singapore and LA and that's the NFT today. Um, streaming channel that's on Amazon, Roku, Fire TV, uh, the, the major streaming platforms in, uh, in the West. Um, and this company is owned. We, we have a, a, a crypto blockchain based social media application. We have a, a DeFi trading platform. We, we, we the, the comp the CEO and the owner of this company owns about five or six other companies and I've been doing marketing for, for this gentleman and all of his businesses for the past uh, three or four years now. Um, I also work with a company called Java Yachting, which is a um, uh, IYT, International Yacht Training Sailing Company. So they offer sailing certifications. Uh, they do boat charters. We have two water sports centers, one on the island of Kolan and one just up the street in Laguna where you can learn to sail uh, smaller dinghies. You can paddleboard and kayak. And um, I do part-time work for them, but they were the ones that provided me a work permit. Perfect. Which allows me to stay in, and live here in the country uh, legally mm. and work here legally, which is very important in a, in a country like Thailand. Uh, although I know that people stay here sometimes for 20 years on tourist visas. Um, I, I feel like that's not the safest way to go about you know, if, if you've made yourself a home here, there's always a chance you could get kicked out or deported or denied entry. Yep. So it's much safer to have legal. Oops, I just spit on your microphone. I don't want it's much better to have legal status uh, when it comes yep. to your visas here. So And, and th this type of work, I was looking on going back to your, your NFT today. I was uh, I came across one of the apps, but I, I, I was on my desktop at the yep. time. This is a. Could you explain that app a little bit? It's called like I can't uh, Tien um, Tien Chat. Tien Chat. Can you? What is the? Were you? Are you behind that in the marketing? And what is that all about? Uh, so Tien Chat was the a, a blockchain based uh, social application, very similar to let's say WeChat. It's actually one of the designers 
uh, actually used to work for WeChat and Tencent. And uh, the idea was to have like a decentralized blockchain based uh, application that also had a built in crypto wallet. Um, but you could post your moments and photos and videos and had like a, a, a built in trading platform, but also um, uh, give utility for crypto. So then there's businesses just like you would find D apps on WeChat. If yep. you guys aren't familiar with that, you can go in, it's kind of like grab, you can go in and you can order food delivered to your house, but you could pay with it using uh, one of, you know, various sorts of cryptocurrency. Um, so I think the idea, the idea behind that was to uh, generate, um, you know, more users and utility in the crypto space that project is still going on. Um, it's been kind of sidelined for some of the other stuff that we're working on right now, uh, which is the NFT today. So we have um, NFT ETH Fund, which is actually a minting platform. Just, just, for, I want to jump into that whole NFT today stuff. I'm watching some episodes and you had some great guests on as well. And I want to talk about that a bit. But uh, Tian Chat, just a quick question about that. Now, is that like a social like uh, network that people are connecting on it similar to WeChat? And is it a hot wallet, like a DeFi wallet as well? Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. So yeah. no di similar to like, you know, connecting to MetaMask. And, and then I understand that you're, you're explaining like you're getting like uh, incentive tokens as well, mm -hmm. being a part of that. Maybe yep. social tokens. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, so let's jump back into NFT today. I noticed you guys kind of started like, would you say late? 2021 yeah the the company actually launched i think in um september october of how did that come together how did this 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 idea even start well uh my boss uh in in the u.s william tn uh he wanted to create a um uh nft minting platform a proprietary one uh which is called uh eth fund and um i think the, the part of NFT today was that this is still a very new and growing space. And if you can educate people on what NFTs are and let them hear from, uh, from people in the industry, you know, in, in, a, in a more of a simple way by doing interviews with people like yourself or others, um, when you educate people, you can potentially create more users or consumers of a product uh, or services. And so I think the, the intention behind this was, look, let's, let's get a streaming channel out on all the major streaming uh, platforms and let's teach people what NFTs are, why they have value, what the, what the utility purposes that they have, you know, are they good investments? Um, and so the idea was basically just go talk to people who are in the field and let's, let's out videos so that people can learn about it so it's a yeah it's kind of it's simple uh i don't want to say simple but it's uh organic content strategy growth like almost like a soft sale mm -hmm. like hey here's our, our you're coming for the content and this is what actually we could provide if you're interested mm -hmm. as well Something and, and like that's that. that's the best way especially we do marketing for i don't know led display it's the same way you do a an article on the top five benefits of whatever nfts and that's how you get the get people arriving and then right. you sell from there. Um, are there any long-term goals with NFT today? Where do you see that going? Or, or is it kind of, it's just kind of like sticking on to let's, let's. I think the, I think the next plan here is this, this is again, this is an educational platform, but um, we, I actually wrote a, a treatment, which is a, um, an outline for a film. Um, and we're actually, they just shot a short film that kind of, embraces the technology into the film. I wasn't a part of the short film, but I wrote a treatment for a feature film, which is basically um, almost like the way the big short tried to explain the, the, the market crash through like a very entertaining film, you know, to create a film that uh, explains NFTs and, and, and show how they can be valuable, especially to, to different people who maybe don't have much. And so the, the, the premise of this film was that, um, there's a couple guys who had uh, kind of lost everything. They become homeless. They're living on the streets in California. Um, write what you know. I was in California. I saw all the homeless people, and I said, well, this is, this is a great premise. And then I thought about that. One of the first big NFTs that was a photo collage. Um, I forget who did it, but it was sold for like $69 million, and it was called like the first thousand days or something like that. And it was like a, a photo collage that had been put together into an NFT. And so um, 
the, the film premise is these guys are homeless. They meet some social worker whose father's in the, in the tech industry. And um, they start taking photos of like day-to-day -day life uh, in, in being what life on the streets is like, a homeless life. Mm -hmm. And then because of the social workers and her father, they basically come up with the idea, they get the idea that this could be turned, this life on the, of the streets of, of homeless people in LA could be turned into a photo collage NFT, which then they sell make money and get off the streets. Is and this, is this video out or, or? No, 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 okay. no, no, no. This is just a, a short of a film idea that we're in the process okay. of, of, of trying to shoot a feature film in LA. That would be, you know, like I said, kind of like the big short We're we're, we're taking a, a big concept and we're trying to put it into like real life terms and that people can see and under, see and feel it and understand like, Oh, okay. So if, if homeless people in LA can sell an NFT, so, yeah, yeah. Then maybe I can too. You know. Yeah, and like just that. to simp simplify it, that that's why I kind of take a step back, and I believe that there might be something bigger behind NFTs and what's happening today, and that maybe just this whole digital artwork and image is just to allow us to understand the technology. Maybe there was some sort of PR marketing campaign, much larger than we even understand, much larger than probably Gary V maybe even understands, because it allows us to get it at that level okay, I'm buying digital art and that has a value because it's limited and I own that piece. But a lot of people don't really understand the, the Web 3.0 and that NFT technology is way bigger than what anyone can imagine. And it can be used for anything. I, I was having a, a laugh with Hans earlier about this. I don't know, we could probably talk about it. I said, if you're a drug dealer... You could have an NFT collection <laughs> and you're, just give them a call up and you can live off the Ethereum of blockchain. And there you go. Well, <laughs> you're speaking of marketing for NFTs in general. Um, I don't know who came up with non-fungible token, but that is just an awful. Mouthful. It might disappear. It's it, like, you need to come up with a, a new branding for NFTs and whether yeah. it's a newfound treasure or yeah. narwhal falcon turtle, I don't care what it is, yeah. but it needs to be something other than non-fungible token. Cause that's just like, huh? It's a mouthful. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts? Because you've interviewed quite a few people now. What are your thoughts on the NFT space? Where do you see it going or just general? What do you think about it? You know, so NFTs and in, in the way that I can wrap my head around it, it's like collectibles, like you people who are into shoes or baseball cards or, you know, one-off rarities. And where I see this, is I see a lot of, uh, let's say, athletes who have memorabilia be turned into NFTs. Um, I really like the way that some uh, mu musicians are doing it where they're basically selling NFTs for their songs. Uh, so then the purchasers of the NFTs actually get some sort of royalties from these songs when they're so played on the radio, but it's a way to crowdfund uh, um, an up and coming artist's new album, for example. Um, so I think, I think as we move into the future, um, if the NFTs aren't a fad, and they, you know, like Beanie Babies, if they, if they stick around for a long time, I see people starting to NFT almost anything. anything. Like, uh, digi like properties, like physical properties. Um, we were actually working with a company. Um, we're not anymore, but they were doing um, NFTs of uh, retired Formula One Ferraris that had all been customized and uh, turned into like... It, the, the easiest way to describe it is basically you were buying a timeshare in a Ferrari that was worth like $2 million dollars. Uh, you could drive it on the track. The utility was you could drive it on the track like four times a year with a with a Formula One race uh, driver. So because it's a thousand horsepower car, you can't just get behind the wheel and hit the gas. Like you're no. gonna crash immediately. So the the idea was you could you get on the track with the guy. And it was a cool concept. And so I, I see that I see that I think as we move forward, um, I think anything and everything will be uh, tokenized with yeah, NFTs. Yeah, I think it's uh, the. The sky's the limit. Like it, you can be so creative in this space. It's especially like with the metaverse as well. People ask like, well, what can you do in the metaverse? Whatever you can imagine in the physical world, you can do there. Yeah, just think like the, anything. Ready Player One. That's, See, yeah. I never even watched. It. Everyone keeps. It's re actually a really good movie. It it's um, Spiel Spielberg, isn't it? It was Spielberg. Check and then the uh, the book that was the first mention of the metaverse is a book called Snow Crash, mm. which is um, I actually just read it. Uh, I think it's, I think it was written in the seventies, but it's, it's very similar to the movie of ready player one in that there's like this, uh, you know, 
the metaverse that you log into with VR goggles and, you know, suddenly you're now not just digitally, but almost physically transported into this because you're wearing a bodysuit and you can feel everything and you're running on a track pad that rotates. So yeah. when you're actually walking, but you're not, but it's like a, a treadmill, but that rotates. So you yeah, can they're showing those direction. gloves now where you can touch mm -hmm. and, and feel, feel things. Yep. Yeah. I think that's, it's going to come. And then with smell and sound and well, maybe smell we, will be the fun one. Yeah, yeah, smell be, <laughs> be very interesting. Especially if you can hack into that. <laughs> well, you know, I love VR, but it's still just not real enough. Yeah. Um, you know, my girlfriend didn't want to go scuba diving. She's like, I don't know. I like snorkeling. I don't know about scuba diving. I said, well, here, put on the Oculus and like check out the Great Barrier Reef in, in 3D. And then she's like, oh, okay, yeah, let's, I want to go scuba diving, right? Mm -hmm. So like you can, you can kind of give people a, a taste, so to speak, of what something is. But I don't think we're there yet with the metaverse. Um, I don't think it's real enough yet to suspend my well th there's you know. not the if you watch did you watch the full video w when zuckerberg came out with what is the matter it's about an hour if you watch the to the very very end like literally the cliffs and our notes are like oh this is all just a concept and it's not ready for eight years he lit that's what he I said i didn't watch the whole thing i think i saw the three minute summarized if you version watch on the YouTube. very very end he's like yeah so we can do all this in eight years because the problem, he said, the number one issue is uh, camera sensories. Mm -hmm. He said, that you, you would need your whole house equipped with so many sensory cameras that we're not there yet. And until that cost goes down. So you're talking, that could even be 10 years. It's, it's very similar, like, like even VR. I mean, if you remember, Nintendo had VR in the 80s. If, and I remember it was like some sort of Tetris game or whatever. I mean, we're still not there. You're, I'm, I, I just think the technology is, is just not ready and it's too bulky and it's not integrated until they have that, the, the Ray-Bans maybe working properly, mm -hmm. uh, maybe, because the issue is it's going to be battery power. Where the fuck do you put these batteries? Like right. Now, I see the metaverse having a better purpose when it comes to like, you know what, I could buy a concert ticket to, uh, you know, whatever, Snoop Dogg's playing in, in Madison Square Garden. Well, I can't physically go there, but if I can goggle in and watch the concert that's great um if you want to have a conference call with people from all over the world but you you know rather than do it on zoom or something like that you can goggle in and everyone's sitting around a table and you're having a conversation and it's kind of you know it, it, it's a little bit more realistic i mean those are real world applications where i see um for someone like myself i don't think i could see myself like living in a digital world because Again, the real world is awesome. I mean, you know, if you go sailing, it's incredible. If you go scuba diving, it's amazing. If you ride motorcycles through Laos, mm. these are, you know, you, you can't beat the real thing. And then what about food? You know, you, you're going to eat yeah. digital pizza? Well, I think you can, ca it'd be interesting <laughs> to capture those experiences, meaning like if you're in New York and you, uh, miss scuba diving in Thailand and it's the freezing cold weather, maybe just to kind of, tickle that taste bud you can throw on the oculus and go touch it sure. um or if you you know you, you did a motorbike tour in laos and you're again back home wherever you are and you just want to remember that experience little things like that what i i foresee some things in the metaverse that will work it's maybe in the real estate world especially with timeshares and maybe housing uh, viewing houses you can mm -hmm. you can see 30 ho houses from your, your you know your your own living room well, that could be interesting we were doing that um uh Back in North Carolina, we actually had what's called a Matterport 3D camera, and you'd scan the house, and then, you know, you could get on your phone or your laptop or whatever, and you could just literally walk through the house yeah. uh, and do a virtual tour of the real thing, and you could put meta tags in there, like, this is a Sub-Zero fridge, and this is a, I don't know, a four-range yeah. industrial hood for your, you know, whatever. Whatever you wanted to put in there, you could you could tag it. And that was very helpful for people who wanted to buy a house because then they could, they could do exactly what you're saying. You could look at a bunch of houses online, virtually tour them, and then narrow it down so you're not wasting your time or the realtor's time. Yeah, and be connected with the, the realtor, realtors or homeowners in the house and, hey, can you open the drawer? I want to see in there. Or oh, whatever, yeah, if whatever. you were doing it live. Yeah, yeah that live, would be something like that. Um, and how are, how are we on time? One hour, 40? 125. See, I'm always spot on. I get close. 
close to it. Okay. We need to get a clock up here. Yeah, we really do, eh? <laughs> we should get a clock. We should get a timer. That was the first time I've heard yeah. your Canadian accent, by the way. Well, you really do, out. eh? <laughs> came out. <laughs> it came out. out. Slips out time to time. Um, a couple questions now. I, I guess we're reversing the ro- sure. roles on the NFT side. Have you uh, done any minting? Do you own any NFTs? Do you are you still kind of looking and waiting before you make a decision? I did mint an NFT, um, and it was my first one, first and only one. Um, it was basically a first person shot of the first time I sailed a catamaran, and I was sailing it up through Pangna Bay, which is just this absolutely beautiful area. So it's like me looking at the at the instrument panel and the and the steering wheel and i look up i check the sails i look back down i look up and i look over at the beautiful vistas and mountains that that are out there and um and that was it then i called it like my first time sailing a catamaran or something like that and i minted this nft and i put as a utility so in case anyone wants to buy it that uh, and i made 10 of them that if the, the purchasers of this nfts if they come to phuket um, they get a free day of sail training on uh, on like a small dinghy boat. Since I work for and them. how would people? It's on Open Seas or it's on Rarables? No, or? it's only on it's on our NFT uh, platform, our ETH Fund platform. So they would go to ETH Fund. They can um, well, it's been minted, so they can just purchase it. And all of them are there owners of them all already? No, or? no, none of them have sold. Okay, yeah, but it's still early. I'm yeah, yeah. The, I mean, the idea was like I wanted to give it at least a utility purpose, but of course, if you're in I don't know, Siberia, and you buy this NFT, yeah. you've got to physically come to Phuket to take a sailing lesson. Mm. So will anyone buy it? No, but it was really, well, hope probably, probably not. Well, <laughs> but, it, it could sell, I mean, even for people on the island, I mean, go check it out. I mean, free sailing lesson and, and the price, I mean, it's probably, there's value behind it in that sense of the utility. Um, I think I set it for like 0.25 or something. 0.25, I don't know, or 0.2, it's 0.25 ETH. Yeah. So what is that? Uh, I don't know. Like, at the time, less than a thousand bucks. No, 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 sure. no. It was maybe point one. I, like at the t- it's basically, I think it was valued at around like 200 250 oh, okay. dollars, um, yeah. which is about the equivalent of uh, a day's uh, private sailboat training lesson. Now, how, how would that work if someone now they own that NFT, they can consistently reuse it? That part, how how does that work? Just one time. And then, does it burn to the ether? The, like where, where does that NFT go after they use it or can they sell it to someone or they could resell it. Um, it's, it, it, it's just a GIF, right? So it's okay. just an animated GIF of like, uh, um, I, could they resell it with the utility? I don't think I thought that far ahead. Uh, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to go buy them all. <laughs> no. <don't, laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, this was really just more of an, like a me walking through the process of, using our platform and trying to figure out like, how does this work? Uh, and you know, how, how do I create an, an mint uh, an NFT on my own? And so I was doing this as actually part of a tutorial video mm. so that other people could watch it and see the process. Yeah. And it's really not that complicated, the whole creating the collection side. Uh, um, I've also heard like on other platforms, like not specifically open seas because it is on the Ethereum blockchain, but I, th- I want to say it's rareables or, uh, there's a couple of them where they, they live on the polygon pl- blockchain. So essentially it's pretty much neck next to nothing to even, uh, create a collection and, right. you, and you can sell them at zero and then in the future add utility and then, uh, the owners can start to put the price up and you have a commission and blah, blah, blah. Uh, one of the questions we like to ask on the podcast, especially for, um, I don't think we've had a digital no, nomad, especially in terms of marketing on the podcast yet. So we like to ask the question, what is a typical day in the life of you? Uh, of What is the typical day in the life of, of yourself, of John? What do you do? You wake up. I mean, is everything quite consistent or are things changing day to day? I think it's a good question. Um, it does change day to day. Um, generally I'm on the computer first thing in the morning, um, because my office is in LA, I usually wake up to a lot of, uh, WhatsApp text messaging and and chains or some emails from that. Um, depending on what I'm focusing on, because I do have a full-time job and a part-time job, uh, depending on what the day calls for, I may have to go to the water sports center and fly the drone around and get some shots for like a video for, uh, the Java company. Um, I would say that most of, most of my days, the, the majority of them are on my computer 
uh, either doing edit, editing videos or uploading videos to the back end content that have been created by our other content creators in the U S. Um, and then usually about three o'clock, um, I will say that's it. I'm done for the day. Uh, I might read a book, go to the beach, go snorkeling, ride around the motorcycle, um, go for a run or, you know, crack a beer and watch the sunset. So, um, it's a pretty, I feel like I'm already semi-retired because of where we live. Yep. Um, and, and when I say a full-time job, it, I, I don't need to work eight hours a day because I might work seven days a week. So I might work four hours today and then at night, maybe I get back on my computer and I do a couple more hours. There's not so much um, that I have, it's very rare that I have very hard deadlines. It's like something needs to get done, get it done. Uh, and I have to like kind of make a deadline for myself and say like, okay, this needs to be done before Friday because blah, 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 blah. Um, so now, you, you're creating blocks of time of maybe two, yeah, three hour blocks. I do, I do it in blocks of time. So that way I can allow myself to have free time to enjoy the beautiful places, or, you know, the beautiful place that we live and the activities that I enjoy. Uh, so it, it's not uncommon some, some nights that I get on my computer after dinner and I'm working on my computer until midnight. Um, it's not uncommon that I, you know, I'm on the computer from, eight, nine in the morning until four o'clock in the afternoon or five o'clock. And I say, all right, that's it. I'm turning it off. I'm going outside. Yo, and, and people need to understand also living in Phuket. I mean, when you first move here, you're a tourist. You can be out from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. That's all right. When you live here, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. is too damn hot anyway. It's hot. <laughs> so, like, you kind of want to be at home in your air con or in a gym or in a restaurant. Yeah. Um, working or a coffee shop, you don't want to be out on the motorbike at 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. ripping around. It's you'll come back absolutely destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, which I mean, we've all had those sunburns when you you know you get on with a sleeveless shirt. And, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, and it's you're destroyed for the next day. It's yeah, terrible. I'm, I'm. I think I got a pretty good tan now. I'm. You got been on base. the boat for like three days, and uh, all the hair has turned yellow that was black. You know, so like the, even the beard is going yellowish orange where it used to yeah. be all white. So I'm getting. Sun bleaching the white hairs. Yeah, and especially Thailand and even Phuket, the sun's, it's another beast. It's a beast of its own. It's so strong here. Mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't mess around. Go, going back to the scheduling, though, uh, I think for digital nomads, mm -hmm. and, and especially myself in general, you really do need to kind of make a schedule for yourself, whether that's wake up at 7, go for a walk in the morning, come home, you know, have breakfast, get on my computer. But you, you kind of need to force yourself into a schedule Otherwise, it can become uh, maybe a little too too much scattered. Like I, it helps for me. I like to write things down. Uh, maybe people use apps on their phone, but I just physically write it down on a whiteboard. And I and I like writing it down on the whiteboard and then being able to be like, oh, cross that one off, cross that yeah. one off. It feels it's satisfying to to cross off the things I've accomplished that day um, or for that week. And um, yeah, so I think you know, kind of creating or forcing yourself to have a schedule is very bene beneficial than just being like, oh, whatever. Yeah, it's not, uh, you, you learn quite quickly, like, you're you're not really, you don't become a tourist as well. You, you start to treat this as a home, and, and it's no different than if you're living, you know, back home in New York, minus the travel to work, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is quite yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no travel, that's that's the best part. All right, well, we'll wrap this up. We're probably at, uh, an, let me guess, wait, let me go one hour 40. 33 damn way off all right close perfect timing um so john this is your camera everything you want to plug in terms of like if you want uh if people to reach out for you for free freelance and tv uh, nft tv or even uh, oh i mean i'll involved. just i'll just put titles up on screen well i well we'll do it if it's for because well, we'll we're gonna launch this podcast on our channel and then oh okay yeah. okay yeah so uh, if you want to check out uh some of the content we've created you can go to uh nft today on Amazon Fire or Roku on the streaming channels. You can also check it out online at nfttoday.tv. Um, and then if you want to check out our uh, our minting platform for NFTs, you can go to uh, ETH Fund, ETH, e -T -H, fund .io, um, and you can check out the, uh, the NFT platform we have there, which is still in its infancy, but we are uh, getting some big name uh, celebrities and, and athletes in LA to create some NFTs on our platform. So I'll be looking forward to, uh, to seeing those myself. The biggest one we have now is a uh, Babe Ruth and oh, I forget the other guy's name, uh, autographed ball. 
uh, mm. that we've digitized into a 3D video. Um, and then they would get that the physical as well. Uh, I don't think they'll get the physical. They'll get to own the, the digital version okay. of it, but it's been like scanned in like a 3D. Oh, okay. um, and I, I'm not 100% because I wasn't involved with that, what the utility is on that, but it's exciting anyway. I like it. We, I like being able to see things scanned and then virtually rendered in 3D. It's kind of cool. So, And what about where, where are they going to find you to go yachting? Or sailing. Oh, if you want to go sailing, you can uh, check out javayachting.com or find us on Facebook. Um, and we are opening up a new water sports center. The soft opening is Saturday, February 19th. I don't know if this will air before that. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's in Laguna. It's at Laguna Phuket, which is a wonderful resort. Where where, where in Laguna? Which, which resort? It's right behind the Zana Beach oh, Club. Got it. So, so it's it, basically you just kind of... Uh, anyways, there's restaurants there. Kind of past the golf course, you turn yeah, left. You turn Zana. left. There's yeah. a bunch of uh, beachfront restaurants and bars, and yeah. we're directly behind that with uh, on the on the lake with paddleboards and kayaks and sailboats. And then we, uh, within the next few weeks, we'll be renting paddleboards and kayaks off the beach, and we're bringing up a big catamaran to do sunset uh, cocktail cruises. Oh, that's pretty uh, cool. off of Bangtao Beach. Yeah, it's nice because it's especially when you get into that Lian area. It's quite protected and. You see even a lot of like fishing boats will come hide out there when a mm. storm's coming. They're the ones that usually you can tell, okay, there's something about to happen here. They'll sure. all like come, it, come into that bay. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I guess I could plug one more thing. Yeah, if yeah, you want to sure. check out the YouTube channel that I have, it's called Eastbound and Up. Um, and uh, it's mostly travel films, hopefully educational in nature. That was kind of the idea. How, mu- how often are you doing a film? Um, I'm usually po- I'm posting something every Friday. Um, and then if I do something fun with my 360 camera, like go on a dive or a cool hike or a motorcycle ride, I'll usually post that, those up on Monday. Uh, so generally every Friday night I post a new video. Um, but it's months behind where I'm actually at. Like I'm still posting content from when I was in L.A., which is uh, three months ago. So I, And I've got content from sailing school and I've got content. I mean, I've got, you know, I've, I film stuff all the time. And so it doesn't always make it into the rotation in like the real timeline of my life. Um, Cause I finished my captain's license like back in, I don't know, June or July or August or something, but I still haven't even posted those videos. Um, yeah, I know. I feel it. we did some Muay Thai stuff from last February. We're not even close to finish. Yeah. So in, in editing uh, those videos is a job in and of itself. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. yeah we learned that quick. We used too many cameras. <laughs> we didn't know. We were like, yeah, just use like 10 cameras and we'll deal with it later. Fuck. Not unless you know how to no. sync them all There's up. There's none of that. It was a mess. <laughs> no, that's a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. Hans, where were you? No, Hans wasn't there at that time. <laughs> we're just like, yeah, we'll just do a Muay Thai event and use a bunch of cameras and, uh, yeah, we'll figure it out later. No. Talise is he's still doing it, I feel, for him. It's uh, He's in mm. Brazil now. But mm-hmm. All right. Uh, that wraps up another episode. We don't know how to end these, so we're done. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> We don't know how to end these, so we're done. That's That's the best outro. That's always the outro. (laughs) Yeah.